Hey everybody, my name is Kyla. Welcome to my channel where I talk about the stock market and the economy amongst other things. Today we are going to be talking about China's economic model and how it is essentially falling apart. So for the past several years, China has really relied on investment spending, on property growth to fuel their economy. However, that has diminishing returns over time and they're starting to realize those diminishing returns. And I want to preface this video with the idea that everyone is always saying that China is about to go under and China never really does. Michael Pettis, who is probably one of the top China economists in the whole world, just an incredible economist in general, has studied this for a very long time and pointed out in a recent tweet thread that we've been saying this for the past 10 to 15 years, but it's also been true for the past 10 to 15 years. So China has built out like all these ghost cities, all these different properties that are sitting empty because of how reliant they are on investment spending to boost their economy. Investment spending works until it doesn't. And now the question is, what is China going to do considering that their economy is kind of falling apart? So first we're going to talk about the problems that China faces and Oddlots of course published a very great episode on this and the guest on Oddlots pointed out that there's four main problems. Demand, debt, demographics, and decoupling. So with demand, it goes back to that point about investment spending. So when you grow an economy, there's essentially four ways that you can grow it. It's Signix. So consumption, investment spending, government spending, or exports. The United States, most of their growth, the growth here, is reliant on consumer spending. Consumer spending is 70% of the United States economy. For China, it's way, way less. It's about 40%. And that totally, of course, shifts the how China grows and, of course, makes them more reliant on investment spending. And so the obvious solution for their economic problem would be to shift to consumer spending, to do consumerism like the United States does, right? Just spend more money, people, is how they should grow the economy moving forward. But that's difficult because, number one, household income growth is declining and also the household balance sheets have been deteriorating too because of real estate policies, because of control, which is a big issue in China that we'll talk about. And the main thing is the government really doesn't want to provide fiscal support to their people. So they could do it through the People's Bank of China, which would be monetary policy, central bank policy. They could do it through the government, but basically they don't want uh, households to get any more power than the households already have because that could remove the relevancy of the Chinese Communist Party because they've always been at the center of capital allocation, as the guests on this Oddlots podcast pointed out. There's also demographic issues in China. There's demographic issues everywhere. But now it seems like China's economy is growing slower than India's economy. So India has a booming economy, lots of babies being born there, fertility rates are really high. China's fertility rate dropped to a record low of 1.09 in 2022. And so that creates all sorts of issues too where people don't want to spend. There is a story about a police officer that came up to a citizen in China and was like, hey, don't do that or else like that for the next three generations, your family is going to be in trouble. And this person was like, there won't be a generation after me. There's sort of a mindset shift. And we see this in the United States too, where people are like, I don't really want to have kids. And that's happening in China as well. And of course, there's a lot of history there. You know, the one child policy, of course, created a lot of issues. There is a desire not to have kids and then shifting demographics makes all of it really hard. And there's also a consumer confidence issue. So it seems like there's issues with incentivizing people to spend, um, also worries about whether or not it's going to be a good time to buy a house, similar to the United States. Um, and there's just a confidence shock across the board. But this is a really interesting point because you see it, not to keep on comparing it to the United States, but you see it in the United States, you see it in a lot of countries where there's this idea of reshoring, right? So instead of doing a bunch of globalization, a bunch of global trade, getting uh, exports and imports and doing all of that stuff, it's like, oh, we're just going to build everything here. We're just going to do everything by ourselves. And so the world is kind of decoupling from China in a way. The United States is sort of decoupling from China. China is kind of decoupling from the world. And of course, it's like, as the guest on Allah's pointed out, how could you possibly get rid of China? But it seems like that is going to be the goal of people. Supply chain diversification through reshoring, through friendshoring, through building everything by yourself. There's also the issue of debt. So part of those four Ds that were mentioned earlier, um, 
as Brad's sister, as Joe Weisenthal pointed out on the podcast, China has like an additional three trillion in financial assets that aren't accounted in official official statistics, and they've really relied on debt fueled growth to boost their economy over the past several years. And so they have these like hidden financial assets. They have a bunch of debt because of the investment spending in real estate, these ghost cities that they've built to boost their economy, and everything is kind of coming to a breaking point. Um, and what's really interesting, and the guests on Abbas pointed this out too, is that China was supposed to be inflationary so it was a big story I remember talking to my friend Doug about it it was a big story of like what's going to happen once China reopens like will we have a big inflationary surge and we haven't seen that in fact it's been the opposite once China got through COVID and reopened again everyone thought that they were going to be a positive catalyst for growth and they haven't been and of course there's a lot to say about you know the consumer struggling in China and what that really looks like China is still gambling so the Asian inside Asian gaming had a story called return of Th Chinese travelers boost international passenger numbers at Sydney airport to 89% of pre COVID levels so citizens of China are still going overseas they're still gambling they're still going to Macau which is like a big casino they're still doing all of that stuff really the big issue is the property sector so they've relied on the property sector for a lot of growth massive amounts of debt there i did a lot of work on evergrand back in 2021 that thing is imploding slowly it's like the slowest tipping domino of all time because they defaulted on their debt back in 2021 and now they're declaring bankruptcy but what's crazy about evergrand and what really ties into the risk that's within the property sector is that Evergrande is a lot of things. They're a pig farm, they're a bottled water factory. They have a thing called Evergrande Fairyland, which is kind of like Disneyland. They just have all of these different exposure points that really create a systemic weakness in the Chinese economy because of how reliant it's been on property, on real estate to continue growing. A lot of people pointed out that the consumer in China is mostly okay. A lot, they have a lot of equity in their homes. They have large down payments. Savings rates are north of 30%. But the issue is that in order for their economy to keep growing the way that China probably wants it to, they're going to have to rely on the consumer a little bit more. And Michael Pettis, he wrote this great paper that outlined these five main points that China could do in order to grow their economy. So the first point, China can stay on the current path, uh, large amounts of non-productive investment, just drive up that debt burden. It works, but they would have a lot of debt. They would be in a lot of trouble financially because all these waves of investment have diminishing returns. You can only build so many cities that have nobody living in them. I think it's one fifth or 130 million apartment buildings have nobody living in them in China. One fifth of all apartments, nobody living in them. So you can't keep on doing that. Like that's just not a feasible path forward. And all they've been doing over the past several years to keep their economy growing was waves of infrastructure and property investment. So the second point that Michael points out is that they could do, um, they could replace this non-productive investment in property with productive investment in new forms of technology, but they're not very good at this. Um, so they actually tried to build uh, the semiconductor industry so they weren't so reliant on Taiwan, weren't so reliant on the West, uh, and it created these less sophisticated chips but they were not able to replicate the advanced semiconductors that is produced by companies like TSMC, which of course Taiwan's like the perfect place to produce semiconductors, so it's a whole thing. But that's also a difficult path forward too, because that's a whole different way of thinking about economy. If you could just go and build buildings and grow your economy, that's fine. But if you have to figure out a way to like productively grow, that's rather difficult. And it's a difficult thing to try and solve. The third point that he points out is this rising consumption. So they can support consumers more, they can say, everybody go spend a lot of money and have a blast. The issue there is that she did not want this to happen. He was like, we don't need this Western style of materialism. We need to focus on long-term goals. What that means, I don't know what the long-term goals are, but he was like, yeah, we don't want to replicate the 
essentially mindless consumerism of the West, which I respect as a point, but it's a great way to get the economy growing. It's just to have people spend money and to support them in that way to spend money. But the other two points are they could be growing their tree, they could do more exports. But that goes back to that point about reshoring where everybody is like, well, no, we're gonna start doing things ourselves. And also China's already a really large economy. So it's a little difficult to grow the economy through trade alone. The final point is she's like, they can uh, slow growth. They can chill out, they can do nothing, but they need to stop investing a bunch of money in factories, skyscrapers, and roads, even though that was the thing that took them out of poverty, turned them into a global giant. Um, and there's a lot of nuance there too. Project Syndicate had a good piece on um, how important Hong Kong was to that process for China. Um, but yeah, China is going to have to rethink their economic model. And I think what's super interesting about China rethinking their economic model is that it really highlights the the power of consumerism and how that is kind of the path forward is you have to rely on people within the economy and i think there's like two points within that so number one it's kind of cool that people are that important to the economy you know i feel like we often tend to ignore the consumer part of the economy even though it's so gigantic in the united states we tend to be like oh it's corporations oh the stock market is corporations but we forget that the undercurrent of everything is people but i also think that you know consumerism within itself is harmful it's really bad for the environment it creates it creates a, a way for people to focus on replacement versus repair and it just creates a lot of waste like there's trillions and trillions of dollars in waste and people just consuming things that they don't necessarily need. There was a really interesting article on creative consumption from the Brookings Institute talking about how it's not just satiation that we should seek from consuming things, but rather we should seek to consume creatively. And what that necessarily means is, is complicated within itself. It's to creatively consume, which of course takes money. And there's a lot to be said about advertising regulations, about consumption education, about just making sure that we're more educated consumers in general, because we do inhabit a shared earth with shared resources and we have a shared future. And I feel like when we are constantly thinking about economic growth, it's difficult to remember that. And I feel like this situation with China, where it's like, oh, the obvious path forward is for them just to consume more things. It's like, well, here's maybe a good opportunity to talk about the role of people as both a worker, a consumer, and a citizen of the world that we live in. So China is going to have to rethink their economic model. Um, the power of the consumer should not be denied, but there's a lot to be said about what consumption should look like and how we should really be doing it way more sustainably than we currently are. I hope that you all are doing okay out there and I will talk to you very soon. If you wanna go ahead and hit subscribe, hit the like button, share with a friend, super appreciate it. And uh, yeah, 